by literally millions of modern butterflies. It's actually insane. You can hear them. probably familiar with the monarch, especially if you're from North America. Orange with black stripes, totally iconic. But just pause for a second to think. Can you name a different species of butterfly just off the top of your head? If you're anything like me before I started this project, or the friends and family that I asked, there's a good chance that the monarch is the only one that you know, which seems pretty weird when you think about it. There are around 20,000 different species of butterfly around the world. And yet from emoji keyboards to lower back tattoos, it's only the monarch that seems to have embedded itself in our collective psyche. And maybe it has to do with this. I'm in the Mexican state of Michoacan where every year millions of individuals congregate to overwinter. It's the culmination of one of the world's most spectacular migrations, which starts here. I'm about 4,000 kilometers north and three months in the past at Point Pelee National Park in Canada. It's September and the monarchs here are just starting their long journey south. Point Pelee is the southernmost point of the country, a peninsula jutting out into Lake Erie. As the monarchs start their migration, they're kind of funneled through this spot. They congregate here on this point waiting for favorable winds so they can make it across the lake. Once they leave Point Pelee, these little guys will continue their journey to Michoacan. But if a tiny insect crossing an entire continent wasn't interesting enough, things get really fascinating in the spring. Back in Mexico, they will start to journey north again around March, making it as far as the southern United States and northern Mexico. They breed and they die. Their children continue the migration, making it perhaps to the northern US and southern Canada. After being alive just a month as an adult, they also breed and die. Their children finish the migration to the northernmost reaches of the monarch's range. They also breed, die. Their children, the great-grandchildren of the Mexican monarchs, probably born around early fall, are not quite the same as the others. This generation is physiologically different from the previous ones. They emerge from their chrysalis in a state of sexual diapause, meaning they are not compelled to breed. It's a very energy-intensive activity, after all. With a lifespan 10 times longer than its parents, all that extra energy goes into building fat stores for the journey south. It's that generation of butterflies that are flying over my head right now. They're migrating to a spot a few acres in size on a remote Mexican mountaintop that they've never even been to before. Not only have they never been, neither have their parents or their grandparents. There's not a monarch butterfly alive on this continent that's ever been there before. So this migration is obviously pretty incredible. But there's over 600 other species of butterfly that also are migratory. In fact, every image of other species that I already showed you exhibits some kind of migratory behavior. So there's more to our fascination with the monarch than just that. So maybe it's not the migration that makes us love them. Maybe it's how they migrate. While many species migrate in some capacity, few do with such specificity. These butterflies were spread across a vast swath of Canada and US, about 4 million square kilometers of land. In other words, butterflies that were spread across an area the size of the European Union condense into areas that are collectively the size of two and a half city blocks. 
and they all come to these specific mountaintops that they've never seen before, barely five hectares in total. Those mountaintops are not too far from here. The small ex-mining town of Angangeo, which has embraced the monarch phenomenon with full enthusiasm. But the butterflies have always had a relationship with the people of this region. Their arrival here coincides with Dia de Muertos, or Day of the Dead, and local legend connects the butterflies with the souls of visiting ancestors. Now, perhaps the craziest thing about their ability to find this place is that scientists really don't know how they do it. Experiments suggest it's some combination of built-in solar compass, sensing the Earth's magnetic fields, and instinctual visual cues. There's enough fascinating science about the monarch to fill like 10 more videos. Ultimately though, scientists still can't say with absolute certainty how the monarchs are finding these specific mountains year after year. And when I say mountains, they really are mountains. You have to hike up to the colonies, which live at around 3,000 meters above sea level. So I'm gonna blame the altitude for how much I'm struggling here. I think the migration also really captures our imagination because of the sheer scale of it. I wasn't exaggerating when I said there were literally millions, but that number is getting smaller every year. Much like the polar bear or the sea turtle, the monarch has become kind of an icon of conservation. The only problem with that is that it's not actually clear how threatened they are as a species. So here are the numbers. The population of monarchs that coat these Mexican mountaintops are known as the eastern population. And here in Mexico, they've declined around 80% in the last two decades. Paradoxically, populations in Canada and the US have remained essentially steady. Remember, that's the same population of butterflies. This suggests that threats to the monarch exist primarily along its migratory journey south, as well as to its habitat here in Michoacan. Another population of monarchs exists in North America on the western side of the Rockies, migrating between Canada and California, and their situation is even more dire. Studies suggest that the population has declined as much as 99% in recent years. Meanwhile, stable populations exist in South America, some Caribbean islands, Florida, Hawaii, Australia, New Zealand, other South Pacific islands, Southern Spain, and Morocco. Many of these populations don't migrate at all, and it means that on a global scale, the monarch isn't actually an endangered species. It's also not entirely clear why the North American populations might be in decline. The typical culprits are widely believed to be part of the problem. Climate change, pesticides, disease, logging. One theory though focuses on milkweed. Milkweed is a type of flowering plant that serves an important function for monarch butterflies. It is the only species on which females will lay their eggs and it is the only food source for monarch caterpillars. It also prefers open, recently disturbed spaces, meaning farmers aren't typically fans. But when milkweeds are removed for the benefit of agriculture, it's to the detriment of monarchs. At one point, the Canadian province of Ontario simultaneously considered the monarch a species of special concern and the milkweed a noxious weed. The theory goes that as we humans eliminate milkweed from our farms and gardens, the monarch struggles to find a place to lay their eggs. 
have recalled that milkweeds like wide open, recently disturbed earth. And nothing disturbs the earth quite like humanity. When humans started to clear cut North America, it was good news for the milkweeds. And by extension, one would suppose, good news for the monarch. Humanity's impact on the environment has been so long and so heavy, we can't even be sure what is really natural anymore. It's a very real possibility that this version of the monarch migration we try so hard to save is one that we helped create. My name is Anurag Agarwal. I'm a professor at Cornell University. I'm in the departments of entomology and the department of ecology and evolutionary biology. I would not personally lead with that last line of, that you that you said, but I would say there is no question that um, there is far, 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 far more milkweed now um, than there was 250 years ago. I've been involved in a scientific project where we've taken genetic sequences of the monarchs and of the milkweeds, and uh, we certainly see signatures of a large expansion of both monarchs and milkweeds after the last ice age ended about 12,000 years ago, and uh, an expansion uh, with the cutting down of the forests by European settlers about plus or minus 250 years ago. So uh, it would appear, based on genetic evidence, that um, there's, been a, there's been an expansion. When you look at the data from 1993 to 2002, uh, Kind of any way you parse the data from the Mexican overwintering grounds, there is basically a long-term decline in the area of forest that's occupied by monarchs. And, um, and when you look at that graph, it's a kind of startling and striking uh, graph. I think that the caveats to um, try to understand whether you know, that image means we're the monarch population is spiraling down to extinction are several fold, right? I mean, one of them is that the monarch butterfly in general is a very successful animal. It's been introduced and is a non-native but abundant species in Spain, Hawaii, Australia, New Zealand. Uh, another caveat is that that's one snapshot of the monarch population estimate across that annual cycle. It's been argued, and I think convincingly, that yes, that may be a snapshot, but it's it's a critical one because it's where all of the butterflies, or 97% of them, go to overwinter east of the Rockies. So it's a really good one to measure. The third caveat is, given that uh, this is a high fluctuation species, we don't really have data pre-1993 in the same way. And one thing that's been argued by some is that 1993 to, you know, I don't know, the year 2000 may have been a, a blip in terms of how high the population was. And if we take those seven years out of it, yes, it's still a high fluctuation species, but it looks less like a steep decline. Monarch overwintering populations, which are really important, really have declined in the last 30 years. However, uh, it's unclear clear whether they're threatened, in part because their population dynamics are changing, they may be less migratory now, and it's a known high fluctuation species that may have experienced population lows in the distant past as well. To be clear, I am in no way trying to minimize the serious and alarming declines that the North American population might be experiencing. I'm also in no way trying to criticize the incredible conservation work that so many people do every day for this species. Frankly speaking, their passion is inspiring and the world could use more people like them. So the science is still far from settled, but I think that means perhaps our affection for the monarch has less to do with them and more to do with us. The monarch is a symbol and an important one, but it's not, uh, you know, it's actually not a particularly good model for a conservation icon in some ways. It's not a good model in part because it's so freaking abundant and it successfully colonized these places like Spain and Australia, New Zealand, and Hawaii. In other ways, I'd say it's not a bad model. Migratory species in general are threatened across the planet, whether they are migratory sea turtles or birds or other species. Geographically, 
uh, monarchs cover basically all of North America and more. Its population size, even in its worst years, are in the hundreds of millions. And it feeds as a caterpillar during the day on the tops of leaves and with its highly contrasting white, yellow, and black stripes showing. School children can find them in their backyards. Everybody's heard of them in part because they're so widespread. And to boot, the butterflies fly thousands of miles, you know, and have this sort of migration story, which is, um, you know, kind of unmatched. So, you know, yes, the stars were aligned, but that's a lot of different stars. Like, I'd say it's an appropriate icon, you know, um, you can't say that for most of um, the animal world, period. For whatever reason, the monarch has captured people's imaginations. It has served to engage literally thousands of people in one of the largest citizen science projects on the planet. And it spreads a message of conservation and eco-consciousness to millions more. It's really about conserving functioning habitats and ecosystems, even though the mechanism is often through conserving individual species. It's not about any single species. That's a way to trick ourselves into thinking we're doing a lot of good. It's nuanced, you know, and I think maybe the stage where we are in this, you know, for monarchs, in the science public engagement is that they're ready for some nuance. If people are willing to, to listen a little bit and study a little bit, and if there's people on our you know, scientific end and the journalism end that are willing to transmit some of that, I think that's maybe where we can make some real gains. <laughs>